start this thing now. Um, I'm John Franklin, for anybody who doesn't know. Pretty sure everybody, most everybody knows. Um, I'm the moderator. We're going to start with introductions to the panel, and then we're going to open it up to people's opinions. Everybody's going to have three minutes. Uh, we're not going to ask questions for the first 45 minutes or so, or until everybody's done with their opinions. And then we'll have a question and answer. We'll take a quick break. People can stretch out, get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, stuff like that. And then we will have question, a uh, question and answer session. Um, try and keep it PG. And uh, <laughs> it's nice I'm sitting down. Is quite tall enough to be in this position in this town, but um, the, uh, so we'll, I'm going to try and keep it relatively toned down and not let it get out of hand. Good. So, so I'm just going to start and then we'll, we'll just down. work all the way down. So my name's Gordon Little. I'm a member of your select board. First and foremost, I want to say thank you for coming out tonight. Um, certainly the select board's goal, as well as I think everyone else sitting up here, is to share information. Um, my kind of role being here, I was kind of asked to give an overview of the select board's process on coming to the adoption of this ordinance. So I'm going to attempt it as best. I, I didn't review this with my four colleagues. so. If I've left something out, I'm sorry. If you want to add something, please do. And understand that this is more or less my best attempt at kind of walking us through the process. And I'm going to read this because there are too many little details in here. So the town of Guilford currently has a FEMA flood hazard area, which was established in 1989. That was revised in 2007 by the select board at that time. Regardless of the town's adoption of this ordinance or not, we have a mapped flood hazard area. So I just want to make sure everyone understands that. In 2016, the select board started working with the Wyndham Regional Commission to draft a river corridor um, ordinance under the direction of the 2015 town plan. Over the next 18 months, the draft ordinance was created and reviewed by the select board and to better understand the impact on the town and its residents, an article explaining the ordinance was published in the Guilford Gazette. Postcards were sent to 461 Guilford residents who own property in the existing FEMA area as well as potentially uh, pieces of property that were impacted by this expanded area of this, um, this um, ordinance, inviting them to a public meeting to learn more about the proposed ordinance. Documents and other relevant information were posted on the town website, and the floodplain administrator, Steve Lemke, at the end of the table here, responded by phone and met personally with landowners who had questions about their property. The ordinance takes into consideration the entire town and the environment in which we live, disaster prevention, and Guilford's finances. Specifically, the ordinance minimizes or helps prevent loss of property and life resulting from severe floods. It reduces the draw on Guilford's funds and demand on their public services resulting from a flood. It ensures that future development of flood hazard areas are done in a way that minimizes or eliminates the potential for flooding and the resulting loss or damage to life or property. It makes the town eligible for the maximum amount of disaster funds available. It implements the rec recommendations, goals, and policies of the town plan, in which the planning committee, working with the Wyndham Regional Commission, completed a mitigation plan back in 2015. So after careful investigation and contemplation of the comments from the community about the, the effects on Guilford and its citizens, the select board decided to unanimously support the flood and fluvial erosion hazard ordinance because it protects the safety the property of the entire community as well as minimizes the financial hardship to the town this was by no means an easy decision and i can tell you from my own perspective 
you know, this was a really hard thing. For me personally, I really struggled with the decision to approve the ordinance as a select board member looking out uh, for the best interest of the entire town. I voted with other members of the select board for the adoption of the ordinance. Personally, as a citizen, I'm potentially uh, impacted negatively by this ordinance because a portion of my property is impacted as an outlying corridor, uh, by, by the outlying corridor. So I personally do not like to see the increased regulation. Uh, it potentially adds a layer of cost and interpretation to, of understanding to both the public and to the town. But my responsibility as a select board member is to the town of Guilford and its residents. And for me, I think the most important piece of this is, as a select board member, I felt strongly, as, as others may have, that this should be voted on by the town. It shouldn't necessarily be an ordinance just decided on by the select board. So I'm very pleased that we will have an Australian ballot at town meeting to finalize this. The hope tonight is to really just understand all the issues around it. So okay. I'll turn that over to you, Linda. Thank you. Um, so I'm Linda Hecker. I'm the chair of the uh, Guilford Conservation Commission, which is an official town commission of members appointed by the select board. So I've been a member of the commission for 15 years, and I, I've lost track of how long I'm the chair, but it's been a while. Um, and um, our mission is to, and there's a quote from our mission statement, identify, inventory, foster education about, and help protect Guilford's natural resources for the public good. And we shall help residents and town officials recognize the value of these resources and administer them for the benefit of future generations. So long-term protection of water resources as well as other natural resources is really at the heart of what we do. And we feel very strongly that this ordinance is a specific example of what we are charged to do for the benefit of future generations in Guilford. Um, in addition to our, you know, our mission, we, several members personally experienced some of the devastating damage from Tropical Storm Irene, which kind of led urgency and a very personal aspect to our work. So we've been coordinating with the select board, but specifically with the planning commission, we were charged with writing the natural resource section of the town plan and the updating our flood hazard um, and flood resilience bylaws was a central part of the town plan. And in, in addition, um, after Irene, we saw that there was a really critical need to update our flood regulations to reflect our new scientific knowledge about the dynamics of flooding under the what seems to be ongoing increase in severe weather events. And also, we understood that this was a very controversial issue, so we coordinated with the Planning Commission to gather people's concerns about the ordinance in the form of frequently asked questions. So members of the Planning Commission went out and, and talked to people in town and said, you know, what, what, do you, what concerns you about this ordinance? And then we worked for the best of our ability to answer the questions, and those are in the the mailing that everybody got, so I'm not going to go into them. So I just want people to know those were not made up questions by us. These are questions that we heard around town asked about the ordinance. Um, basically, why we support this in a, in a word is you can't fool Mother Nature. Um, the, the ordinance fulfills our mission to administer resources for the benefit of future generations, and we've been mindful of the research both on increasing frequency of severe weather events and how they impact our natural resources. And so we've known for a long time that, um, but we haven't had until the ordinance, we haven't had a lot of concrete ways to address the understanding that shorelines and river corridors are best left in their natural state, that it's vegetated and undeveloped for reasons of water quality, erosion prevention, and flood resilience. And um, we recognize also that Guilford's part of a larger ecosystem. So what we do here in Guilford impacts our downstream neighbors, just as what our upstream neighbors do impacts us in Guilford. And we really feel that the ordinance protects the people in the river corridors 
the most of all because we're trying to protect you from stuff coming down and washing out, uh, eroding your banks and, and taking out um, buildings on your property. If you attended the Resilient Roads Forum or the, the um, Guilford Fair and got to see the stream table, that's a dramatic hands-on demonstration of the incredible power of erosion that happens when you try to pent up a river by either armoring a bank or building, uh, building structures in its way. It means that the water flows faster and deeper and takes out more of the downstream river bank as a result of that. So in order to pr protect our floodplains, we need to work with nature by allowing the rivers and streams to follow their natural meandering course. And that means limiting what we put in the harm's way in those river corridors. And in summary, we believe that the ordinance is a prudent way to minimize loss of life and property damage and costly costs to the town infrastructure in order to preserve our very precious water resources for future generations. I'm Harry Evans, a member of the uh, Planning Commission, and I've been a member of the Planning Commission for six years, and I was part of the commission in the 2015 uh, plan was adopted by, by, by the town. At that time, we addressed the need to update the flood regulations through the town plan with a special hazard mitigation flood resilience. In this section, we specifically stated the goals and policies of the uh, improved flood resilience. One of these goals is to ensure that Guilford residents participate in and are aware of the hazards and flood resilience plan requirements and response. Since developing the plan, we worked with other town commissions to discuss the optimal means to meet the goals and we had many, many discussions around the audits within the town planning commission. Many, many, we were all over the place. A lot of questions. And I think we still, some still do have some questions. Among the planning commission as a whole, and uh, individual members were, were, were devoted to a large amount of time and energy over the last 18 months gathering information, attending meetings, answering questions, and grappling with the best way to move forward to assure that we make decisions that are in the best interest of the town and residents. We are lucky in our planning commission members presently uh, many different viewpoints. Sometimes this has made it difficult to come up with an outright resolution on the issue. However, we all agreed that, that uh, providing timely and accurate information on the issue to all Guilford residents it was the uh, highest important. Therefore, we've been working with the Conservation Commission to, to uh, put together this pamphlet of frequently asked questions and orders sent out to the uh, Guilford residents. And we will continue to hold discussions and reach out to experts, ask questions, and provide accurate information on this issue as it moves forward to town meeting. And thank you. And if I may turn my hat around again, uh, as a landowner uh, and a resident in town for a good number of years, uh, I feel that we do not need another layer of regulation. We have regulations enough on our land. So that's my position on this ordinance. My name is Lisa Barry. I'm a, an assessor clerk, the assessor clerk in the Lister's office. So um, we're responsible for valuing all the properties in town and creating a grand list um, off of which all your taxes are based. Everyone loves me when I come to visit. Um, I also um, I'm responsible for all of the mapping that we do in town and all the different layers that we've got that can give us a lot of information, including having um, a layer with all of the river corridors and streams with 50-foot buffer as an overlay over the map of town so we can all look and see um, 
we, everybody's properties and, and all of you can look if there's a link in the town website so you can look up your property and see how it may affect your property so if anybody has any questions how to look at that and how to see that you can come see me at the office and I'm not talking anymore <laughs> Uh, I'm Bill Murray. I live down on Weatherhead Hollow Road. Um, I've been a real estate broker at Berkeley and Veller for 37 years. My house and uh, land is in the, uh, the FEMA uh, flood zone as well as the river corridor and will be impacted by the ordinance if it uh, stands. Um, I also own two single family houses in Brattleboro on Frost Place, which are not only in the flood zone, they're in the floodway, which is the most restrictive uh, zone. So, and I deal with people who are selling property that are in flood zones, and so I've got a pretty practical understanding of how that impacts uh, saleability, value, the cost of flood insurance. Um, and I think that the intention of this is really good, and I think the awareness of not building in stupid places makes a lot of sense to me. And I do believe that climate change is very real and it's going to continue to uh, move forward. But I'm not in favor of the ordinance because I feel like a lot of the mapping that it's based on is not detailed enough for the level, for the ground level that we're working with. And I would rather see efforts put into working with the, anybody who has property that's in the zone, working with it to decide where are the places within your property that really are at danger of flood rather than relying on the, the FEMA maps and the, the, the bird's eye view of the, of the location. So I, I'm not in favor of the ordinance. My name is Alyssa Sabeto. I'm a planner at the Wyndham Regional Commission. And um, I wrote the model bylaw that Guilford used. Um, I, I also worked with them on the hazard mitigation plan and Developing these uh, river corridor bylaw was an action identified in the mitigation plan. Um, the town, the select board reached out to me in 2016, and so I customized our model then for the select board and uh, worked with them, and then have been working with them since. Um, and uh, I've worked on a number of these. Um, with other towns as well, and uh, we have a close relationship with Guilford, the Wyndham Regional Commission does, and we also work closely with a and um, I think that the town reached out to me in part because, as Gordon Little and Linda said, they have a pretty, I really appreciate your understanding of the reasoning behind the river corridor, so um, all of that stands, and um, it's really a way to lessen vulnerability for future development and um, something that ANR encourages and as the regional commission we assist the towns with in our region in developing bylaws to uh, mitigate future vulnerabilities. So um, that's my role and my expertise. Hi, I'm John Burker Campbell. I work for the Agency of Natural Resources. I am the regional floodplain manager for Southern Vermont, so my region covers uh, Windsor, Wyndham, and Bennington counties. And in my role as regional floodplain manager, I am a technical resource to the town of Guilford in terms of uh, flood hazard regulations and development within the flood hazard area or river corridor. <coughs> uh, yeah. Short and sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Steve Lemke, I'm the floodplain administrator for the town of Guilford. And I've been looking at this ordinance upside down, inside out for about two and a half years. So uh, in order to stay within my three minutes, I'm going to read a statement. But just before I start, how many of you were at the first public meeting we had back in 2017? All right, so many of you know what we're talking about with River Quarters. Um, so the floodplain administrator is an unpaid volunteer position appointed <laughs> annually by the select board. I was appointed first in March of 2015. As Gordon said and Harry and everybody else, the River Corridor discussions began over two years ago. The town's hazard mitigation uh, um, plan identified flooding and 
fluvial erosion as the number one hazard uh, for the town, and the town plan in lieu of that, uh, or subsequent to that, specifically called for the adoption of the river corridor ordinance to help mitigate those potential hazards. So this goes way back basically to 2015. After two and a half years of personal examining and, and discussing this, I believe the adoption of the River Corridor Ordinance is best for the town as a whole. Like any other town ordinance, whether it be dog control, ATD rules, or road naming, uh, it's not popular with everyone, but I believe it is the best course of action to take for the good of all. It's, design, it's designed to protect people, property, neighbors, first responders, town workers, town infrastructure, and financial resources of the town. Um, so I think the best way for me to explain what is a very complicated 34-page ordinance with lots of detail is to share some actual incidents that illustrate what can happen with and without the ordinance in place. At a public meeting held last November, people shared the following stories. During Tropical Storm Irene, a sauna was washed off its foundation and floated totally intact down the Green River. Fortunately, it sank just moments before it could, it went over the dam and it sank uh, just minutes, moments before it could ram the already compromised Green, Green River Covered Dam, or Green River Covered Bridge. The sauna was completely destroyed and ended up in pieces in the yard of a downstream neighbor. Secondly, a house located a river road in the floodplain next to the Green River was flooded uh, and a person had to be rescued from the rising waters by first responders. Third, a large recreational, recreational vehicle, also parked in the floodplain, was crushed by the force of the water. After hearing these stories, the person in the audience at that meeting asked, how would this ordinance have prevented any of those things from happening? And I'm here to say the answer is the ordinance, as we're talking about it tonight, would have, presented, would have prevented all of these things from happening. Under this ordinance, no sauna could be built that close to the river. So there would be no washing away of the building and near destruction of the covered bridge. And the downstream neighbor, who may be here tonight, uh, would not have to bear the cost of debris removal. Under, under this ordinance, the house that was built in the floodplain and, and destroyed could not be built there. Therefore, the property would not be lost and nobody would have to be rescued, thereby eliminating the danger for first responders. The RV that was turned into an accordion it was an airstream that was about the size, about the length of this table when the water got done with it, would not have been allowed to be stored on the riverbank. In addition, if the ordinance had been in place, the town would have received an extra $35,000 as a result of increased state emergency funding, 5% of a declared disaster. These are real examples of what happened without the ordinance in place, and more importantly to me, how the ordinance will prevent similar situations from occurring in the future. The select board members have done their job, and after much discussion and consideration for individuals and the town as a whole, they unanimously voted to adopt the ordinance. I support their action and urge you to vote in favor of the ordinance by voting no on town meeting day. If you have any general questions about the ordinance or specific questions about your property, you can call me or email me directly. My contact information is posted on the bulletin board over there near the door, one over there one in the back and one over there. And I've talked to literally tens if not hundreds of people since, uh, since the first announcement of this came out with lots of questions, all good questions. Uh, and I've thought long and hard about this and I do believe it's good. Uh, it, overall, it's good for everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're gonna have a statement period uh, just so you all know, I'm the timekeeper too, so I'm not just looking at it. Regarding that property, seems as though this is just a step shy of flood insurance mandate for the homes, the structures that are going to be affected in this town. The other thing that really concerns me about this is that, see, I didn't know about the 2007 law until 2014. Um, uh, 2017, I am sorry. I found out about it on the town website after I received the postcard that the town mailed to 462 residents. Um, in between 2007 and 2017, we did a lot of work on our home. We made an awful lot of investment there um, to a structure that now will never represent the value, the, the investment that we had made in it. I would have chose differently if I knew about that law. But I did not, because there was no check, there was no balance, there was no indication 
We even went to the town clerk. We asked about building permits. We uh, had the listers come out and assess every time work was done. There was never an indication of a problem. You know, to me, it seems like if a law can't impose a requirement or a restriction on one person unless it imposes that requirement or restriction on everybody in a similar circumstance. So when we're considering legislation that requires a building permit for me and not a building permit for my neighbors, I find that very concerning because there's a gray area there and the only outcome of that gray area is the landowner is going to lose if he doesn't follow the proper avenues. And all the responsibility of following those proper avenues is falling on the landowner. Tom, that's three. I'm done. Anybody else? <coughs> Who wants to go next? Can I do a slightly different approach? Sure. You got sure. Everyone knows how I feel about it, so we'll not get into that. My husband so eloquently said out what our situation is, so I don't need to get into that. Um, a few questions that I have that haven't been answered along the way. One is, overall, who controls any changes? Or And please, I want to say all these and get through them, and then people can answer. Sorry. But who will control the changes once it's gone through? In other words, if the river moves, if there's wash away, if there's changes to that 50 feet and goes to 100 feet, who controls that? Uh, another one was the Conservation Committee is, and said what they're for. I believe what they're for. There's a lot of great things that they do. There's a great things that everybody in town does. I don't disagree with that. But listening to our speaker speak brought up vivid memories of the Sweet Palm Project that is currently going by and the 40 turkeys that are down to my house and the eagle that has to remove himself and all of that plant and vegetation life that is now gone this summer and 18 more acres to go. Well, that lake blazes at my head. Somehow, I don't know how we overlook this. I know they're single cell organisms on the most part, but they should have rights too. On the planning commission, I've always been confused on how it seems that a lot of the planning member commissions didn't fully understand or whatever were shocked when this first letter came out according to this ordinance. Uh, to the listers that say that they are involved in mapping, the mapping in this town is really was my entire under my skin. You have on your maps that Sweet Pond is in place. You have on your maps that the rivers that come through the entire area and our area breaks where it shouldn't. You don't have a spillway put on, on Weatherhead Hollow Pond. On my brook, you have it going through a pond that it never even hits. There is so many inconsistencies and so many mistakes. But when you Google Earth or overlay a map on it, you can see the stream going straight, but no, A&R's map and the mapping that is done for this purpose shows it going somewhere else. So I'm struggling to find how everybody can stand right behind something when you can physically see the differences. You haven't admitted that there's any form of wetlands or weedlands or, or floodplains naturally in that water system, which there are. So I really, really am struggling with that. Um, I'm trying to say what it is. The other question was the uh, wording in there was a six channel width. And if there's anybody, maybe Steve Lampke later can tell me what that width actually is and how that works into measurements because people wouldn't know that. Um, thank you, John. I'm all done anyway. Perfect. Michelle. Michelle. Yes. Hi. I can just sit. Yeah. Michelle Frizzi, um, Chair of the Planning Commission. I don't really want to speak right now, but I feel like I should follow that up. Um, this has been a difficult process through the years. I've been the chair of the planning commission for six years now. I've seen the ups and downs of all of it. We have brought people to the table. We've researched. We have tried diligently to come to a consensus among ourselves, and we have not yet. That's honest. It's not wishy-washy, though. It's a good balance that nine people that sit on that board are very different. And that's what's beautiful about it, is that we're taking all 
all people, all parts of Guilford. They live in all four corners of Guilford. Guilford's a big town. If you look at it on the map and you drive and where people come in, it's 20 minutes to get there to the town office for some. And I feel like we have done everything that we can to try to research what this means, what it is. It may not be the right thing in everyone's eyes, but there's a, there's a lot that really matters for the town as a whole. And it's a very simple thing for me, living where I do and going over to visit the streams. This isn't just about Green River. It's about all the watershed, about everything that comes off the mountains and floods into things. And when Irene happens or whatever, like my basement was flooded. I don't live in this floodplain, but I saw the impact. I saw like eight inches of water in the basement of my home. But it, when I take my kids to play in the Broad Brook and trees fall, there's no Irene recently. When you, you go down there and you'll be there one week and two weeks later, that particular place you were playing in just on a local stream is changed without a major storm. A tree is down, the bank is, you ask about the six feet, the, the six times, like you can see it, it's now a completely different, it's probably 10 no, no, no. times. But I, I don't wanna answer, I'm just saying that you never know. Yeah. There's a, and um, we can't <laughs> control Mother Nature and we can't control how we each view it together. No, it's not a consensus. I don't want the planning commission to like be thrown under the bus in it. We did write this in the town plan. I will stand behind that because we're looking out for the best interest of the town as a whole. It's not been an easy process. We have diligently tried to fight through it, talk about it, bring the right people in, keep persevering. Thank you, Perry, for sitting there right now. Um, it, it's a lot involved for all people in our town. Um, but the, the, the bottom line to me in all of this is that I, I was heard that it was said that before 2007 you didn't know. And what we care about as the Planning Commission is communication. And so when you choose to try to communicate, it brings up more fire. I just want to say that. So the more that you share, the more these moments happen. All right, so we are, our job is to try to help make sure that we can share all the information we have. Sorry, John, just over three, but. Yeah. I'd like to ask Scott, who, who on the board, uh, um, Scott, with my brother, is anybody on the board a member of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns? No? Oh, okay. Well, I am as a select board member, technically. <coughs> oh, okay. I, was I guess. Sure. Remember, yeah, oh, so as I understand it, they're paid for by the taxpayers, the BCL, the D, um, to give advice, and they have lawyers to tell us, like, board members what they can do, what how they can push, what they can push for, and what they can get away with as far as uh, um, infringing on people's property rights. And this, that's what this does. Um, it's designed to protect property, what well, yeah, as you say, but not property rights. Uh, and those come first, according to the guys who uh, are on our money and wrote the Constitution. And uh, Marbury versus Madison, 1803, I'm not a constitutional expert, but those who claim to be say that that was a bad court decision. The Supreme Court, even Thomas Jefferson said so, and because it set up the precedent where uh, much later, uh, Citizens United got passed by the uh, Supreme Court. But there was a, actually, I understand a good part of Marbury versus Madison was where they, the Chief Justice apparently said um, words to the effect of that just because a law is passed, local, federal, state, or local, municipal, if it's unconstitutional, then it's, un if it, then it's null and void from its inception. Basically, you can, you can ignore it, is what uh, I understand. And that was, that's in, was repeated in other cases like uh, Miranda versus Arizona, I understand. Um, but this reminds me, uh, you know, the, the idea, this is like a, a law being passed saying, okay, you have a tree on the edge of your property, it's a large tree, and it's kind of leaning, it's going to fall someday, and it's leaning a little bit on your, uh, threatening your neighbor's uh, nice Airstream or RV where the, your neighbor likes to park their RV or, what, or out, their outhouse or a tool shed or whatever, and, uh, and you have to pay to remove it, like it or not. And if you don't do it by a certain date, there's going to be fines for you, and that's what this calls for. I'm going to have to get rid of the, the old RV. I was going to get rid of it someday anyways, but be told I, I, would, I would face fines if I don't get it. That's, uh, uh, but the main thing that this does, it, it, it takes away my property rights. It says that 50% of my building 
my cabin gets destroyed by whatever the tree falling down or nothing to, it could be nothing to do with uh, flooding or or, uh, or uh, global warming which you believe in apparently uh, those of you who passed this uh, but nonetheless 50 percent of my place is destroyed I can't rebuild it that's total uh, totally unconstitutional and uh, it's, it, it reminds me of when I got registered to vote in Guilford in the first place years ago and because they were trying to pass um, zoning and this is basically these bylaws flood approval bylaws are basically like uh, the effect of zoning for people that live near a brook like me and, uh, and, and it's like that tree uh, you know hypothetical tree ordinance and uh, it's destroying property rights you, you can't do it and attack like Miss Heckler said uh, things can go downstream and take out the banks uh, no rivers the water itself is what, what takes out big a tree go down broad brook all the time and, and uh, usually because of after the flood but uh, they don't take out homes they don't take out RVs and, and they, they it's um, you know it, that's three minutes yeah you can't you can't do this <laughs> Power and authority. You may have the power to do it, but you don't have the authority in the law. Yeah. Uh, Bill Jewell, uh, <clears throat> I have kind of a comment and a question. Uh, I know that FEMA flood ordinance has an opportunity for landowners to uh, adjust the thing based on uh, actual things on the ground because the FEMA thing is kind of a broad brush thing. I was wondering if there's a uh, an on the ground adjustment like a Loma that, that would be in this ordinance. I forgot, forgot that, that earlier. Um, so we're going to have a question here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, do you want to come up then with that one? Uh, anybody else have statements for that? Go ahead. My name's Ken Moulton. I live on Bassett Hill Road and uh, I own a farm there. And uh, where we live, it's mostly high and dry, and I see on the uh, map there that uh, it's showing my property as a wetland. We do have a wet weather brook uh, in the most heaviest rains we've ever got. The culvert that goes under the road is maybe half filled, and uh, we put our land into a land trust because we want to preserve uh, the land and this and that, but now I see restrictions. Uh, what's going to happen? They'll tell me I can't hay because it goes right through my hay fields. Uh, well, they say agricultural, but uh, where do the restrictions end? I, I mean, to map that out as a wetland uh, for a, uh, you know, there's a little swamp there that gets water in it, you know, in the spring, but uh, now there's naturally water in it, but in the summer it was completely dried up, and yet it shows me as uh, being in a, <coughs> in a zone. So it's like one shoe fits all. I think, you know, in cases like that, it, it should be looked at that uh, there is no hazard there. There's never been any erosion uh, on my property whatsoever. Ann. Ann Ryder, live on Tater Lane. Um, I was on the select board in 2007 when the original uh, bylaw passed the, uh, that people referred to. As is the case with all ordinance or bylaws, we had a meeting outside of the select board meeting to review and to invite the public to make a comment. Um, what we did not do is this kind of process that people are talking about. Um, and I think the language that we received as we did that ordinance was from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. I would call it, in a sense, boilerplate language, that we did not create it. We used the language that was, rec you know, that was recommended to us by the state to protect the most members of the community as possible. Uh, Irene was a wake-up call. If we had not had that ordinance in place, the bylaw, um, we would not have gotten the financial assistance that we did get to deal with the massive damage that existed in this town. Um, I, I, I think, Bill, I, I disagree with you because I think maps can be adjusted. That's not a reason to toss out the ordinance. 
And I think that we all need to look at the greater good for the greater community, which is why, I, I mean, I obviously I supported this in 2007 when I voted for it. I support it now. Um, I think that, yes, you know, the, the main affected property, people like the Martins are going to be affected as much by if they sell when they go to their bank, if they get insurance, if they have a mortgage, things like that. It is not required by this ordinance. That I see any requirements. You can hay with this, you can log, you can do what you want to do, but it's being realistic about what, you know, what kind of risk you're taking if you already have a structure in a floodplain, and it's saying that in the future you shouldn't put one in, be, uh, put a structure in a floodplain, because that protects all of us. So that's my comment. Can you respond to that? Uh, does anybody else? I'll at the end of the statements. And, Thank you. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, I saw Mary Ann's hand first, and I'll go to that. Um, Mary Ann Lawrence, Weatherhead Hall Road. Um, just a couple of things. I wasn't even going to say anything, but um, a lot of people associate the, there was a pond by the fairgrounds, and that pond was actually on a piece of property that we own. And there's no pond there now. There's a beautiful field. Irene took that dam out. And we don't have the money to even think about restructuring what was there to have that pond. So it, I, I don't really have any feeling either way. You know, it, I think somebody said Mother Nature is going to be Mother Nature. That's what's going to happen. And that's kind of how John and I look at it. And now we have a beautiful field that now he has to mow. <laughs> um, and then the other thing was is, and um, when Steve brought up the ordinances, like the dog ordinance and the ATV ordinance, both of which have impacted me in several different ways, I just hope that the select board or whoever takes on the ordinance part of it deals with the people who are affected, but then the people who don't get affected or do something and nobody acts on it because as I said the ATV ordinance around our house doesn't really get acted on and as former dog person in this area the dog ordinance doesn't get you know it were used as it should so I just hope that the select board is or whoever it would be is prepared to take on the people who have issues whether they're good issues or bad issues yeah <coughs> Tucky Holton uh, we own the uh, old rice farm which is just off where that all the road uh, bordering <laughs> both sides of it we have uh, a lot of fields that we we rent the land out and it's harvested every year now in high water when there is a flood we have some of it gets flooded and it isn't fit for animals to eat but that's that's not that happens it's always happened but now um, in, 45 years ago, we drained down through our property going east to the, to the west side of the, <clears throat> where that olive brook. And now that pipeline has plugged up. Um, what, what do I, do I have the opportunity to put a ditch in there, to drain that. I've got a few acres, or, I don't know, I haven't measured it, but there's, there's some land that now stays wet all the time. It, it, that pipeline is plugged up, I've unplugged it two or three times, but then we get another storm and it plugs up again. So it never did it in it for 40 years, but now it does. So I need to do something different. Between that and the beavers, we have a slight problem, I guess. But I want to be able to address it, and I want to get that land back into producing. Um, it is floodplain. I guess we got as much as anybody does, but uh, if it, it's a workable situation if we can get rid of that water. 
Uh, I don't know if this is going to be a foot in the door to add on some more little restrictions or not, but whatever it is, we got a problem. And thank you for listening to me. Veranda. Hi, I'm Veranda, and I'm on the select board, but the main thing I wanted to say is that practically, well, there are people who have jobs up there, but um, there's a tremendous amount of volunteering going on to try to, uh, to address all of these issues that people are having um, and we had you know we're really lucky to have Steve be our floodplain administrator um, there is actually a permitting process from my understanding that went with the I can't remember whether it was 2007 or 1989 but we we never had anybody, I mean, just as the ATVs and we haven't currently got a dog officer, you know, like, we are not at full capacity to, to take care of our own here right now. And also, we're kind of doing the best we can to uh, to look out for each other and serve, and I think that nobody likes regulation. Those of uh, us who were born in the houses that we live in and grew up here, or those of us who came from someplace else, the the latitude that we have for living is something that we all value. And so having, uh, you know, I'm saying two things. One is everybody is welcome to take a more active role in this process. And also that, uh, that we're trying to do the most we can with the least intervention in your lives. <coughs> Um, I, 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 I really appreciate how much energy people have put into this and I in no way interpret somebody's support for this ordinance or uh, uh, the idea that it's beneficial to the town and to individuals. I have no issue with that. My issue is with the presumption that the responsibility to um, it's in the ordinance. The burden of proof shall be on the appellant. A letter of map amendment from FEMA shall constitute proof. Um, the, the initial thing is the information presented on any maps or contained in any studies adopted by reference is presumed accurate. Well, I know that the maps aren't accurate because I work with people who have to spend their money to get a letter of um, amendment from FEMA and it's it's a process where it can be 600 to 3,000 bucks to do it even if you can there's some places where clearly the property is in the flood zone but there are a lot of other places that are shown where the buildings that are on the property are not in the flood zone and the map is just not accurate and so I guess my issue with the ordinance is we already have a FEMA that's the original map. We have the Agency of Natural Resources River Corridor map. And then for Guilford to have a flood administrator, and, and I have huge respect for how much work and how much knowledge you have, but I don't see the benefit to Guilford in, t in putting themselves in a position where they're basing the decisions on the flawed original maps and then putting the burden on the individual homeowner to challenge the map. If, if the flood administrator could go out, look at the situation, say, yeah, that makes sense to me. 
I, I don't think your house is in the flood zone, even though the FEMA map shows it is. That would be one thing, but that's not how I've seen this work. I've seen it work that the individual has to find a surveyor, the surveyor has to find elevation points on the maps, which do not exist on a lot of the, the FEMA maps because Guilford's not as enough of a population density, and I'm probably not explaining exactly why it isn't. The maps aren't as fully developed as they are in places like perhaps Brattleboro or Burlington. But it just feels like if you put one more layer of ordinance or bylaw on top of two existing ones that are all aimed at the same similar thing, that all three of them have the same flaw. And rather than do that, <coughs> I would love to see the town spend time and energy working with anybody whose property is within the zone to come out and look at where it affects your property and say, yeah, you're in the, this is definitely in the flood zone. You, even if you spend the money for a loan, you're not going to avoid this versus the places where it is in the flood zone and the map needs to be adjusted. I'd much rather see the town put its energy into that than to creating one more level of, of bureaucracy. If nobody else has anything. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm Jeff Houghton. I live at 416 Guilford Center Road, and my everybody knows where the trucks are parked. My house is in the zone. Um, and if my house gets washed, off of Guilford Center Road, there is not going to be nothing left of Algiers. And there goes to Bill's thing of, you know, who something needs to be looked at. Uh, my name's Christina Bergatti. Um, I live on East Mountain Road, but I also have a business on uh, Wolaska Drive, right off of Route 5. Uh, technically, I guess both our properties are within a flood zone because we have a swamp up at the top of the mountain, and down below we have a brook that merges into two. Um, I know this isn't Q&A, so I'm not going to really expect anything till later. Um, <clears throat> you want to keep it until the question? Well, no, no just, just a few things. Is 5% um, of monies isn't really that large when you consider the actual amount of the structures here. I understand to a personal person losing certain assets, you know, it could be a personal hit. I know that when we got insurance, especially because of the business, our insurer actually showed up and physically assessed everything individually. Um, that's one thing. Uh, another thing would be, you mentioned nature would be nature. Uh, we have beavers. We pulled the dam out. I mean, I guess we could say to help the farmer down the road, they don't get any water. Um, but, you know, a six-page mailer later, and I still have more questions than answers. And even with this meeting so far, which hopefully we'll get answers later, I still can't quite figure out exactly what's going on. That six pages was basically a wasted tree. I'll go onto the website and see what's there. But between somebody with a master's and a certificate of advanced graduate studies, I feel like there's a lack of communication in the town, despite you are trying to do this, and I appreciate your effort and your time for that. Um, and another question I just had, and it's just sort of a general statement, is we're doing all these things for like FEMA and flood insurance and all this, but if you're really that worried about washouts, why hasn't my culvert been cleared since it's been put in? Um, that's just a side statement. I'm sure I'll think more things later, but I thank you for your time and for listening. Anybody else? If I could just make a quick clarification. Uh, sure, and then we'll go to a break. Okay. Just listening to everyone talk about Irene and when it came, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that I'm in the house probably most impacted and most everybody in the room agrees. I have never in 20 years had an ounce of water in my cellar. For 40 years, my lawn was a pond. That structure received no damage. So just, just to put that in your, in your thoughts when you're thinking about what happened to you, here I am the most victimized and supposedly the biggest threat in town but yet not ever a drop. Thank you. Uh, let's take five minutes. Stretch, stretch out and get a drink of water. So we're going to do some clarifications on some of the things that came up 
Uh, Tucky, I'll work with you on the tile drainage. That's in the RAP, it's not in this ordinance. And Ken, there's nothing in the ordinance about not being able to farm it. It's just about buildings and things like that. So just to clarify that, what we're saying is that Ken Hay and the drainage part is an egg issue not covered by this ordinance. So that, that's pastures not an issue. Then, but one question is, seeing part of my property is considered a wetland, which it really isn't, can that affect my insurance uh, on my home, which is 20 feet higher than that? Is it a wetland or is it a floodplain? I think it's just a wetland. It's not a floodplain, I don't think. Not where you are, I don't think. It's a wetland. Yeah. So if it's a wetland, it's not jurisdictional to the town anywhere. You should contact the district wetlands ecologists. But I'll take a look at your property and I'll give you I'll give you a call and we'll talk it over so we know for certain. So we don't we're not guessing without looking at not just the maps either, but on site. Okay, thank you. So you should talk about on site. Sure. sure. So I'm just gonna just Three quick points of clarification from kind of questions and comments that came up in Bill Jewell has left the building, I believe. Yes. Um, one of them was his. So uh, Bill had asked about on the ground adjustments to the maps. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we do. We as the Agency of Natural Resources, we created the, the river corridor maps. We also will come out at no <coughs> cost to you and your property to walk around to see if there are adjustments that are warranted. We did it with uh, Shannon Pitt, like the river scientist, and I went to, to Bill's house I don't know if it was last year or the year before. This summer. We walked around uh, looking, at, looking at different issues, looking if there's bedrock outcroppings or other the visible things on site that would limit the river from adjusting. Uh, there was a question over here about um, if your house is destroyed, you can't rebuild it. No, you can rebuild it on the existing footprint under the proposed bylaw. Without a permit? You would need a, you would need a permit. So the rights are taken away. You turn it into permit. You would, your not, rights aren't taken away. If your house is destroyed, you can come in and get a permit to rebuild your house on the existing footprint. A permit is a permit. It's not. A, it's not. Permits are about licenses, about privileges, not rights. I, I. That's a question that I don't think is going to be answered or addressed here. <laughs> the property rights are being destroyed, uh, finished by this bylaw, and that's what. That's what matters. And the other question was related to flood insurance. Uh, within the river corridor, there is no flood insurance mandate within the for properties within the river corridor that currently exists for properties within the map flood hazard area that will not change under the proposed bylaw. So, if you were the president of the bank that somebody in that river corridor was living in, and they wanted to borrow money, would you give them the money without asking them to insure against that identified risk? Well, I am not the president of a bank, so I cannot answer that question. Um, Banks can set their own rules, but as it as federal law states currently, there is only a, a flood insurance requirement for properties within the map flood hazard area. Okay, so currently, there is no there is no foreseeable instance in the future where river corridors will carry a flood insurance requirement. Can I answer that with a piece of fact that's fairly recent? Um, I had a long conversation with people at People's Bank, uh, talking to the loan originators and everybody else. What most pro what most banks do for federally insured loans is they don't do they don't make any decisions on their own. Uh, as it's described to me, and as I know, the loan originators sit there and they wait till the paperwork comes in and it says yes or no on, and they say it just comes to me. I don't know if it comes in a dream or wherever, but I got to the bottom. Of it. it comes from a, a company among others called CoreLogic, yeah. and CoreLogic's only uh, uh, function is to look at FEMA maps. And, and do the, and, and say whether you're in or out of FEMA. And I went to CoreLogic and I said, do you consider river corridors, even though there's no ordinance, but do you just, because the corridors are mapped, do you consider those in your judgment and do you pass that on to the bank? And CoreLogic says, what, so what's a river corridor, All right? Yeah. So they do not, I, I question them again, they do not do anything except look at FEMA maps. So in your situation, if you if, if somebody's not in the corridor now and it is it's no insurance required now and the banks don't even look at it nor does their their service agency called CoreLogic. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Helen Shepard, Sweet Pond Road. Uh, question that 
I was encouraged to bring up is, um, so we're in the 50 foot area, um, or it looks like one of our little build, one, we have two buildings really close to each other, so maybe one is, one isn't, it's a little hard to tell, but um, one of the questions is our septic, uh, our, our leach field being behind one of those between one of the houses and the brook, um, if, God forbid, at some point, I'm holding my breath if it fails, um, if, if the brook runs here, our buildings are right here, um, the road is right at, you know, we're right on the road in a little teeny piece. So would that be affected by the 50 foot issue as a... Uh, in terms of like a replacement on-site system? Yeah, if we had to, you know, if it failed. So, so currently, again, the town can't regulate on the, the placement or design of an on-site wastewater system that goes to the agency of natural resources. There's currently no prohibition within the agency on, uh, as far as I'm aware, on septic systems in, within the river corridor. Okay. They, it's also, they, so it's also why you don't see it in the, you don't see septic in here because it's a state, you know, it's a state issue, not a, okay. not a local issue. Correct. So when you're using the word river corridor, is that referring to that 50 foot? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm using it to, to cover for, both, the, both the map river corridor and that 50 foot small stream setback. Okay. Uh, just to, to follow up about the septic system and what they just said is accurate, but if you agency of natural resources looking at the septic permitting, if there's a designated wetland on the property, the wetland department will look at that. Okay. And those two departments will work together to figure out. And sometimes they, they all have good intentions, but it's sometimes one person's viewpoint is is maybe in conflict is too strong a term. But one person wants their uh, needs satisfied, the other one wants theirs, and sometimes the two of them negotiating the best way to do it is a little bit of a dance. And I guess part of what I'm concerned about is if you add a local flood administrator as a third party onto that, it, it becomes even more complicated. An example would be down in uh, Green River Village, what was the old tavern building? It's a green house, two, door, two houses from the bridge. That uh, sold this last year, and there was an ancient septic system that sort of preventative care. We said, let's figure out where this septic is going before we put it on the market. We figured out that it was a system that had served its purpose, but it was at the end of its life. So we worked with the, an engineer at the Agency of Natural Resources um, to design a system that could go in. At the tail end of things, the wetland department had to weigh in on that. And it, it ended up happening, but I, suspect, I was told and it, the ordinance wasn't in place so that we didn't have to comply with the, the, this ordinance as well, but that that would have been one additional layer on top of what was already kind of fitting it in between road, river, neighboring uh, septic systems, neighboring wells. So it just adds one more level of, of complexity to, to the situation. Not to be argumentative, it won't. I disagree. Okay. Uh, towns cannot regulate on-site wastewater systems under state law. Uh, there's very few exceptions to that rule. Okay. So unless Guilford becomes a, one of those exempt towns, which uh, is a pretty high bar, I think there's only one in the state, uh, then the town cannot regulate the placement or design of an on-site wastewater system. So this wouldn't in any way affect placing a septic system? Correct. Okay. And it's also why there's no town ordinance about septic systems. No, but the uh, the ordinance in uh, I think it's uh, section six or seven uh, discusses uh, water supply or wells, waste disposal on site, septics. Doesn't mention the word septics, and also mentions propane tanks and other things, all of which are of special concern, and they are mentioned in the ordinance without any specification. 
of how to handle them, except some broad statement about Well, that. it's pretty clear that if you have septic system, if you have if you have propane tanks and things yeah. like that in the corridor, first of all, they can't be there unless they're unless they're uh, tethered until they're until they're tied down in an right. appropriate way. And if you have uh, if you have systems that have to be raised up to a reasonable level, you know, so it's they they are dealt with. I mean, it's not like they're not in here. I don't have the ordinance in front of me, but there is a section where the general statement is made about on-site waste disposal and the water supply. There, there is some, the statement I think you're probably referencing is it's on page nine. If you have the ordinance in front of you, it's number twelve. Sanitary sewage systems shall be designed to minimize or eliminate infiltration of flood waters into the systems and discharges from the systems into flood waters. That is boilerplate FEMA uh, regulation language. That has to be in there, uh, and not being overly familiar with the on-site wastewater rules, I suspect they're already being designed to meet that standard. So this is not a, a new bar or a higher bar. This is something that's currently being done. If the state would, if, if there was a floodplain or a river quarter, the state would consider that when they're looking at your design. But it's not going to be something that the town weighs in on. Well, it's in the ordinance. It's open to the town. To enforce if they want to. Well, I think, way. Michael, what happens when you look at the words that are as nebulous as designed to minimize or eliminate. They are nebulous you know, words. Uh, that's, but that's scary. It looks like, it looks <laughs> like words are nebulous. Minimize. It's a little scary. But I think what John is saying is the case. It's, it's in here as boilerplate, but not. You know, I, I, understand, I understand that it's in here and it can't come out, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be a deal breaker in that, in that sequence. Right? Because John and I and others will be talking about that. I, and, and again, to make it clear, I can't issue a permit uh, or deny a permit without sending it on to a &R to look at. And whether it's John or whether it's Rob Evans, who's the, the state uh, floodplain administrator, uh, who I have had a number of conversations with, I don't do it by myself. I do it in consultation with other people. So that when it goes up and it comes back and, and John says, well, I think you should take a look at this or you're, you're being too harsh about this. That's what happens. And we don't do that in a vacuum. We talk about it with the, uh, with the, with the property owner. I wish Steve Redman were here today because we could talk about his bridge that he did. You know, it was a, it was a complicated <coughs> issue. It, was, you know, it had a lot of things to go along with it. Uh, it took a lot of work on one side. Not a lot of work on the like, whole point, but just a lot of discussion about what's right and what's wrong and what can be done and what can't be done. <clears throat> Anybody else have a question? Can, can I? I just want to back up, John, and ask you to just walk through again. If a landowner has a question about their parcel, you said you come out and look at it. Would you change anything after visualization from an AR ANR standpoint for the landowner after that meeting if in fact the landowner was accurate that their property was not being impacted the way it was outlined in the map? If, if, it, if, there's the, if it warrants changing, if there's things that are on the ground that are obvious to, to change it, then yes, we, we make that change. It won't change on the map only because that's a a limitation of state resources, uh, but but we we make the change, and then when we do a, a wholesale kind of map update, you add it to we it. would we would you would see that change. So the it. burden of expense, if in fact the landowner is accurate that there's a misrepresentation according to the ANR map, is is not on the landowner. Correct. It is on ANR, and will eventually make it to the map form down the road. Correct. Unlike unlike. The flood hazard area, people were talking about, I think Bill, you were saying, you know, in, in Brattleboro, people get Loma's letter of map amendments, you have to hire a surveyor, an engineer to come out. There is a cost to the property owner to do that process within the map flood hazard area. Within the river corridor, you call Steve, you call me directly, we come out to your property. And is, it a, is there some, is it a letter or is it what's the form that it takes? Uh, so, to be honest, we the maps that we've seen have been relatively accurate. So the ones that we've gone out and done, there hasn't, uh, there hasn't. I don't, I'm trying to think of an example of where we've where we've done that amendment. Um, well, one that we talked about was Lord of Lifty's place, which is on the ledge. Correct. Right. There that, you go. That would be 
there is there's somebody who, and I don't think London I hope it does mind, but London Lipke's property on, uh, on Broadbrook is, is about as close to the water as you can get. If you were in a submarine, you'd be farther away from the water. Uh, so the issue, though, that happens with him is that John and I went out and looked at it because he requested it. And, and it was icy and, and we couldn't get down to the water level or the water level, water level was high. But it's our firm belief that London is not actually going to end up in the court uh, because of the ledge that he has. So even though he's sitting right on the water, it's ledge. It, that water's not going to do fluvial erosion underneath it. It's not going to come up to, uh, to his property. So that is one where I think that, uh, that we would see change. I was right in the car with John and Shannon Pitlick, who's the river scientist. Um, and we were driving down uh, River Road, and we looked at it, and I said, okay, so the corridor runs up here. And Shannon looked, and she said, those houses right there should probably not be in the river corridor because it's got plenty of floodplain on the opposite side. So the water, rather than fighting its way up on that hill, is not going to do that. It's going to flood into the plain. So there are times, admittedly, 100%, that when that when John comes out or Shannon looks at it, those changes will be made. Are you going to be able to turn on the map the next day and see them? No, but I will know it. There will be a letter. I'll send a letter to the people saying, just for your information, you are not in the river court. So does my neighbor London get a patent? And if he does, I should too, because the, the river, unlike my neighbor uh, up above London and me, uh, where they've been building a whole bunch of rocks in a cage formation uh, in order to, because the centrifugal force of the water is being on that uh, cage full of rocks instead of uh, eating away at the, the, well, there's a cabin there that's eventually going to fall down someday, but um, uh, what about the fact that the centrifugal force takes the brook away from my cabin, I'm on the safe side, and uh, like London uh, is, it, 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 I think I'm even better off, a little higher up. Uh, should we get a, a variance, a, a you legal? Should, you should call that guy that number right there, and I'll come out and take a look at it. That's you. If I, if I agree, yeah. a, amen, brother. So and if I agree with it, uh, this is the next line of attack right here. And believe me, there's no. We'll there's get no something problem. written saying that we, we are, are exempt from the flood of Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Potentially. I mean, I, if, we've never been to your site. I want to be clear. If you are, you know, if you are not in, you will get a letter that says you're not in. If There's a way in, to after the vote March 5th, if, to, if it doesn't, you know, get overturned, then then I'll have to deal with that. Right, but, but if you're in, you're in. And we and I get calls from some people, and I look at the map, and here's the river quarter, and here's their house. They're in. You know, there's no way around it. But the people on the fringe. That's, that's where you really have to look at it. And I know what happened in 2007 with your place in the uh, Tammy and Tom, is that when the maps were redone in 2007, they really didn't redraw the maps, they digitized the maps. And what happened is that you were always in the FEMA area. I have just a blood hazard determination from the core logic that says differently. It's just that they couldn't see it, and now they can see it. Well, they haven't looked right because they don't have it. Do you know anybody, any building in Guilford or wherever that's built? Like Mrs. Uh, Heckler seems to think that many places, many cabins, houses are built uh, at, in the, where the river had to be misdirected and to, uh, um, you know, the, the house is built in the way of the stream, quote unquote. Uh, I don't know of any place that where the natural direction of the flow of the river had to be changed in order to build a cabin or a home. Uh, you know, I think when I was a kid, my mom took me to that tourist place called the uh, just Jelly Mill. Uh, it was built right all over on uh, Sticky Brook. You look down in the porch, you see the brook. Uh, I know there was at least one Frank Lloyd Wright building built right over the stream. Um, but um, today, they wouldn't be able to build something like that, even though that, that doesn't change the course of the river. It's, it's only a, 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 a possible threat to somebody downstream if the river took out the home. Uh, but but <coughs> Mrs. Heckler's I notion that um, I don't, there aren't any places that, are, that were built where, where the direction of a, a brook or stream had to be changed in order to build the uh, I didn't the say that. that. That's what you see me saying. That's no. That's what I heard. I, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no. It's just that some houses are in the floodplain and are endangered, all well, like the house that Steve mentioned, where the man, uh, you know, which is now destroyed and where somebody had to be rescued. Just a little ways further down the river, the, the Green River from Guilford in, in Leiden at the 10 mile bridge, uh, entire big ranch house just taken out completely. And there's just a, there's a teepee there now. But I, I knew the people who live there. That house is gone. The, um, the, 
One second. Yeah. Um, the meeting was scheduled to yeah. end at right. 8 if anybody needs to leave. I don't want you to Please feel do awkward. So. You can leave if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't want you to feel you have to stay. Uh, that's fine. If, you want, if I wanted you and John to come out, could I just call you any time after this ordinance becomes effective? Or, or it's the only when you have a project in mind. So, you call it. so you can come out and in the abstract make a decision that you are not in the car at this point. So it's technically effective now. You can call any time. We have limited resources to, right. to respond to requests. If you have a project plans and are looking at coming in for a permit. Yes. That's that will that will that will you know increase the importance and sure. uh, not to say we don't we're not trying but to be as responsive as possible but the other but I have some rudimentary knowledge on this stuff so if you call me I have to go about eight minutes to get your house back we could probably take a look at it together yeah. and decide if what you want to do makes sense and then I could say just generally am I right in considering it you don't need both to look at the same okay. you know base to assume it's a base. And I encourage everybody else, use the number. Because if you haven't talked to me yet and you want to, be nice. But um, but if you have a question, and, and I'm sorry, I, I can't remember her name. Uh, yeah, Is it Christina? Okay. I'm not certain which questions you don't have answered yet. But if you have more of them, you give me a buzz and we can just talk about it. Or, I'll stop by or something else and we can talk about what's really there. Because this really is about information. And you know, no matter what happens, if we had it to do again, I would definitely do this again because sending out those 461 postcards was like ringing a bell in this town for a lot of people who were doing a lot of things that even if they don't like ordinances and the rest of it, they will now know that there are some things to consider before they do things that they probably would wish they hadn't done. Right? And you don't need an ordinance to, uh, to be wise. You know, so I'm just saying this was a whole ins instance of raising the awareness level and the educational level of what flood, 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 <laughs> what flood and fluvial erosion is and what FEMA is and special flood hazard areas. So I really appreciate everybody who came out tonight. I appreciate BCTV for, for taping this because now we can reference people to it and they can look at it. So if you have questions, give me a call or email. People can also learn the difference between rights and privileges. That's right. It's probably in the dictionary. I had a place to say that sentiment. That the thing that is so different from this, about this from 2007, is the effort that the town has made to get people aware of this. Um, it is my biggest problem with what happened in 2007 is I never knew until one day I got cornered by my bank. But that that's another story. Um, you guys really have brought this into the public eye, and I really do appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate saying. you saying that. Yeah. Michelle, first. John, I would like, I, I wanted to speak to you, and thank you so much for saying that, because as chair of the planning commission, I, I just want to reiterate, this has been an extremely difficult process. Our board is 4554 at any given moment, um, because so many direct people are directly affected by this. And that mailer that everyone received came from us. Not like directly, the Conservation Commission did the bulk of the work, but the Planning Commission wasn't at ease. And there was a lot of questions that needed to be answered. And so we did our best to sit around the table as nine very different people, bringing all of our questions to light. And we posed them, we gave them to the Conservation Commission, they worked hard with them, um, the select board saw them. And it, it took months. I mean, I don't know, Linda, how many months? Like, like, six nine months it, it's been a long time yeah, yeah, yeah. it was early last summer when we started working on this okay. and to me like thank you for saying it. it's about communication we may not all always agree but we are trying to understand what's going on around us and it's not someone pulling the, the wool over our eyes like we really are trying to talk as a town everyone that's volunteering every person up there it's a volunteer thing and we're working together to keep Guilford moving forward and I think this is, a, this is a very hard topic. I know that a lot of people still don't know how they're gonna to feel about it in the end, but I feel like we've come together as a town to work on this and move forward. So I, I just wanted to say that I'm really proud of Guilford and having seen the panel that's not all in agreement. 
right now. I think that's a big statement for the town, like trying to bring people that have a voice and it doesn't all have to be on one side. It's not one person saying this is how it is. Like we all have different opinions and it, it's beautiful to, to see a voice tonight. I, I feel like it's been a really great name. So just want to say that. Jamie? Um, just a real quick two part question if I could, or maybe I don't know how to word this, but anyways. The uh, state of Vermont Constitution says that you may not leave a landowner without the right to live in their home or their purchased property for its intended purpose. And I don't see how making me pay six to ten thousand dollars to replace my fuel tank or my water tank or something like that that's already in place would actually do that. And also I would really like an answer on what the town or any of the committee members or any of the panelists would do or plan to do about the improper mapping that is in Guilford's worst interest. You're not helping at all. Um, often the good news and the bad news is the same news, and that's what's happening right now. FEMA is getting ready to remap uh, the parts, two sides of Guilford. I mean, it incorporates all of Guilford, but it's the Middle Connecticut River watershed and the Deerfield watershed. I went to a, a meeting in Turner's Falls a month so are ago. Are we admitting that Sweet Pond is empty at the moment? Or is that still a hidden secret? Um, the facts aren't in yet, but they're looking at everything and we're taking we're taking maps of Guilford and circling areas that are of primary concern. And your area, your, your house has a circle around it because I went to the, I'm not saying that it's going to make a difference, but they're looking at it. So it, every time we talk to you, Tom and Tammy, John and I try to find another way that they makes sense. He showed the river going through the pond next right. door to me, which so, it does not and it never has. So what I suggest again is I should take another ride out and we'll look at what you got. I'm interested in what you said about. You've seen the bedrock, but that doesn't count. I'm interested in what you said about core logic too. Uh, yeah, so anyway, just to clarify, I also have a second one that says I am employed. Oh, and that was dated May 2007. From a FEMA panel meeting. But it's still since we bought the property. Pardon me. It's a guy that wears his glasses, his reading glasses. So thanks, for, thanks for John for our moderating. Yes, he did. Thank you. I saw you put your hand up, John. Well, I think you're here. Yeah. Just a comment uh, on the planning commission. As a planning commission member, I kind of looked at this with kind of an open, open mind. I was uh, one way or the other, but uh, even though it was going to affect me and not, uh, I kept asking the questions. I kept asking questions, didn't get answers, and then it led other people started asking questions. So we had a lot of back and forth there, a lot, a lot of the education to uh, get all the internet. Thank all of you for being up there. It's really, it's really great. Well, thank you all for being here. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you.